Last video, I reviewed the entirety of the Black Butler anime, but a lot of the anime, and when I say a lot, I mean the majority, almost all of it, is not canon with the manga, like season one and season two was not, was almost entirely not canon. The OVAs are good. Watch the OVAs. Screw seasons one and two. So I decided to read the manga and compare and contrast the manga with the anime to see just how much they got wrong. Not only that, I read beyond where the anime covered. And you wanna know why? Cause it gets really good in the manga. It gets shockingly good in the manga. You guys should read the manga. So let's just see how good or bad the anime is compared to the manga. When it comes to the very beginning of the manga, the events are basically one to one. Though somehow electronic video games exist now, I'm not a great fan of that. I guess all of that historical accuracy is thrown out the window. Sebastian also doesn't say that he's one hell of a butler, which I feel is was a nice touch in the anime. He does say that he's a devil of a butler, which is a, a bit on the nose. They also didn't include how the initial guest was planning on assassinating CL and showing how deadly Sebastian is, which was also a great addition to the anime. For the sake of the Black Butler fans who no doubt already watched the anime, I'm going to skip ahead to when there's substantial differences between the anime and manga and skip the beginning introductions. Watch my video of the anime if you haven't already. Also, apparently the Shota vibes are a, a bit more present in the colored pages. I'm hoping this isn't like a thing in the manga and thus far as I know, it, it's not a thing in the manga, it's just, and the colored pages. One thing I can say is that when Ciel and his aunt are playing chess and he explains why he came back to the Phantom Hive Manor, in the anime he said it wasn't for revenge and then describes revenge. In the, in the manga, they make it more clear that it's he came back to not to avenge his parents, but to make whoever did this to him feel the same humiliation that he suffered. He wants revenge, just not for his parents, it's for himself. They also do a better job showing how CL's aunt actually cares for CL as if he were her own son, and not just feeling the guilt of seeing her sister inside CL, which, which makes her inability to kill CL feel more real in the future. And for those of you who need a refresh, CL's aunt was working with Grell as Jack the Ripper. They also explained that his aunt did have an alibi, and all the murders was actually smarter than how they made her in the anime. Grell would do the murders when she needed to save face. You also really get the feeling that people got the hots for Grell the same reason they got the hots for Jeff the Killer. Grell fits perfectly with creepypasta vibes. Another important detail is that during the first encounter with Grell, Grell does not say that she can tell them who's killed CL's parents. That was shoehorned into the anime. Immediately after Grell's introduction, the plot already shifts away from what occurred in the anime, and we now flesh out CL's other aunt, you know, Lizzie's mother. I think she appeared once or twice in the anime, but she's a proper character in the manga. I also don't think it was directly mentioned, but CL is 13 years old. Can't forget about the Indian curry arc. That's canon too. I'm not crazy about this arc, but I do hope Soma and Agni do more outside of this one arc. They're painfully boring in the anime. Also, thank goodness they explain why Agni's blessed right hand is so strong. They just explain that he gets it from his strong devotion to his faith. It's just that he's super religious, which makes sense since deific powers are real in this world, Sebastian being proof of that. We learn a smidge more info about CL and his brand. Apparently, they called it the Mark of the Noble Beast. It's at the end of the curry contest do we see the real deviation from the manga. The queen being a proper, full-grown adult and not some kid and some strange masked person who I'm assuming is her butler, appear on horseback. Prince Soma finds out Mina doesn't really like him and Soma actually apologizes for not realizing and being selfish. They make him actually likable act and actually grow and there was no weird mind corruption thing that happened in the anime also the queen is adorable she dotes on CL for being a good little boy that always does a good job. Lao and Ran Mao are actually kind of scary, just to maintain their power and fear over others. They straight up either beat or kill the guy who went up against CL in the curry competition. Immediately after the curry arc, the queen gives him tickets to investigate the circus. Jeez, I, I did not realize how much of season one was non-canon. That's just painful. 
No wonder the antagonist sucks. Soma and Agni never leave Ciel's manor because Ciel decides to employ them. Soma refused to leave hoping to learn to be a proper gentleman, so Ciel knew there was no getting rid of them. The events of Noah's Ark Circus align with the events in Season 3 OVA. It would seem they really did a proper job with their new pursuit with Black Butler with their OVAs. I didn't cover Will the Reaper in my previous video. I was expecting him to have been added to the anime as part of the soft reboot they were doing with the OVAs, but he's actually in the manga as well. Color me surprised. They really are being faithful down to the last T. Will's presence is really foreshadowing that there's supposed to be a great tragedy in the area soon. The circus arc is really the first time we see CL work independently of Sebastian. We see how competent and incompetent he can be in these types of situations. And in reality, this is the first time we see a concrete setting of CL's past and the people who stole him that pushed him to form a pact with Sebastian in the first place. This also does a good job of cementing CL's pessimistic mindset, how he believes justice is a sham created to maintain the power of the wealthy, like a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Crime isn't wrong, everyone is a criminal in their own way in the eyes of CL. This is also the first real time we see the prowess of the rest of the staff. Like, the anime had a lot of the major ideas that were going into the story, but just didn't know the right execution. I'm honestly impressed. The events of the circus arc conclude just as in the OVA. I'm guessing we're not going to see too much of a change from the manga until we start covering newer arcs, but at least this shows just how much of the anime was made up and just where they start making things up in the OVAs or where they really take place. In between the major arcs, they seem to introduce a short story fleshing out fun side characters just to round out the world, which is cute and fun. It, it's a nice breath in between the darker main stories. It's a smidge of comedy that the series desperately needs. Now for the murder mystery arc. It begins the same, but in the manga, there's a lot of inner monologues of Professor Arthur and I didn't mention this in my previous video, but this odd guest who is a struggling writer is actually Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, prior to him writing the stories of Sherlock Holmes. The twist is supposed to be that he started writing Sherlock Holmes after being inspired by the events at the Phantom Hive Manor. The inner monologues of Professor Arthur makes the whole story so much more intense. There's a stronger air of despair and horror, and they commit plenty of time to the professor as he slowly tries to piece together the mystery. This arc really shines in the manga. The Charleses, or the Queen's Butlers, seem to have it out for CL, waiting to see him crumble under the weight of his re responsibilities, even if it means sabotaging him. And now Snake is working for the Phantom Hives. I also seem to have made an assumption in my video covering the anime. The Book of Atlantic OVA doesn't take place on the SS Atlantic. I was wondering why a United States ship was doing there. It takes place on the HMS Campania. Analyzing the story separate from the anime, The Undertaker becoming the overarching villain is sorely needed. Black Butler has just been random stories that doesn't have an overarching plot. The Undertaker becoming the main antagonist fills a massive void that was a glaring problem in the manga. I also like how they expand more on why the Grim Reapers oppose Sebastian. Since he's a demon that eats souls, demons directly mess with their line of work, which makes total sense. Ciel really does a good job being his own character that will take matters into his own hands. Even if he's super underpowered, he's not helpless. I got the sense that the real main character was Sebastian in the anime with how incompetent Ciel was. With the manga, from the get-go, CL could always go it alone for a short while and handle some situations. This is actually the first time we get to see Grell after the Jack the Ripper case. She's been on a long hiatus. I wish there were more characters with skirts, because the way Toboso draws the action scenes with Lizzie is impressive. It's like a cape. It has so much flair. So you find out the Undertaker was a Grim Reaper and that he's the one responsible for reanimating the dead. And here we really have a groundwork for rules in this world. There's a separation between the body, memories, and the soul. The soul is taken by Grim Reapers, and the body and the memories are left behind. The Undertaker even went so far as to try and create artificial souls, though he failed. He sees death, or dead body specifically, as beautiful. 
His interest was just to create something unique to him, though I don't feel like it's a satisfying motivation. The Victorian era was an era in pursuit of a lot of romanticism, so it's not all too strange given the circumstance. The purpose of Sebastian being hit by the scythe and seeing his cinematic record is really the payoff and explanation of how CL and Sebastian met. They give you plenty of info on CL's past, but this moment was really supposed to be a big payoff to the secret. We've seen this in the anime prior to now, so it didn't have as much of an impact as it does in the manga. Judging by the flashback, the strange cult intended to summon Sebastian for wealth and infinite life. Life. They just didn't understand that it was actually CL that summoned the demon and not their ritual. Just a quick recap, CL grabs the Undertaker's chain of amulets as the ship goes sinking. If you read the mini comics that are at the ends of some volumes of the manga, it's really fun because they make it very clear that the mangaka sort of just stumbled upon becoming a mangaka. The story of the manga is definitely way better constructed than the anime. And the new OVAs? of the anime seem to be following the story in the manga to a T, save for some details. We seem to be now getting to a point where the story seems to be heading off in a really good direction. Like there, there's actually like a proper overarching story and not just like a bunch of little arcs that are standalone. They're, like it's all starting to, uh, to interconnect with each other. And since we've completely caught up with the anime thus far, I just wanna take a second to ask you to subscribe before we go beyond the anime. There's gonna be spoilers ahead for the upcoming season or OVA or OVA season, whatever they do this time. So if you're more of a hardcore, I only watch the anime, first of all, how dare you? Second of all, this is the point where you should subscribe and probably share this video with someone else who actually likes the manga. Next up, CL is sent on another mission from the queen. This time he's to attend college. And there's the Perfect Four, a group of perfect gentlemen. This is starting to look like the setup to an Ultima game. Not even joking, they took some notes from Harry Potter, only some, but CL's actual goal is to investigate the disappearance of one of the queen's relatives that attends the school. Derek never returned home last summer. Sebastian managed to place himself as housemaster, not headmaster, housemaster of Blue House, just to make sure that he can aid CL. Sadly, there's more than one housemaster, and they're super strict on tradition. So CL needs to learn the rules quick. And there's a lot of hazing of the newbies. For example, and I'm not making this up, they have a thing called fag time. And I quote, it's a tradition peculiar to Weston College where a lower boy is assigned to attend to a particular senior. I know, <laughs> I know they mean being their lackey, you know, like their underling, you know, like doing their laundry for them. But guys, do we, can we, could we seriously not choose a different word when localizing it? I know that's technically the word, historically, like that's a thing, it's a real thing, and that is what it was called, because this is Britain land, you British folk. I mean, I guess this is more of an American thing with how we changed it, but still, dang, really? Again, I quote, fags are different from butlers in that a senior may Take care of his fag as well. It's sort of like a brotherly relationship limited to the school, you might say. They had to know what they were doing. They had to. I, 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 I could fully believe they did this intentionally just because they knew it'd be funny. Yes, this is this was an actual practice, that of which is no longer done. But guys, come on! And I know this may be shocking for some of you to hear that word, but one, I'm quoting the manga, and two, I am one of them queers. I've kissed some dudes, I feel like I get the F-word pass. And since Derek, the missing person, went missing while he was under the Violet Wolf House, CL decides to investigate there and maybe become his... Oh, I can't keep saying this word. Uh, his, his lackey. Yeah, his lackey. They're, they're also super spooky in Halloween core. Also, Lizzie's older brother goes to the school. He hasn't been important yet, but uh, he might be. Side note, the level of skill the mangaka has developed is practically exponential. They seem to have mastered disappearing outlines and full black shading. Toboso talks about how much they want to improve, and it shows. However, Maurice Cole, the Red House lackey, is sabotaging CL from becoming a lackey himself. Now, it's a one-on-one -on -one battle against CL and Maurice. If for no other reason than because, I mean, come on, screw that guy. 
I should probably phrase that better. Uh, so they got to spy on him and pick up dirt. Ciel manages to gather evidence of Cole delegating all his duties to underlings, evidence that he's not actually fit for his job. Cole decides to get, uh... <clears throat> harmful pictures of CL, to put it lightly, in order to keep him in check. But that was also part of the plan as the prefects burst in to catch Cole red-handed, and Cole loses his position as Lackey of Red House. Proving himself worthy, CL becomes Lackey to Blue House, or that's what I would say, but really he's the Lackey of the Prefect's Lackey, which is still uh, better than before, but not where he needs to be. In a ballsy move, now that CL can hang out and talk with the prefects, he casually mentions that he has this one friend from a while back and name drops Derek Arden, the missing person, which seems to particularly tick off the prefect of Violet House. Apparently, it was one of the headmasters that transferred Derek to Violet House. The last hope is to talk directly with the headmaster who transferred Derek. CL needs to be invited to the tea party with him. And the only way now now is through the Tri Wizard, uh, uh, the the cricket tournament. Of course, in order to assure victory, CL cheats by having Sebastian poison their food with laxatives and gets invited to the tea party with the headmaster. All things considered, they did a good job making a short sports arc. I never thought I'd care about cricket, but Yana Taboso proves to slowly become more and more master of their craft. Sebastian has been trying to hunt down the headmaster, and when he finally goes into strike, the headmaster disappears, leading him to believe that the headmaster is a demon of some sort. As CL enters the tea party, he immediately confronts the headmaster about the whereabouts of Derek Arden and the other missing students, and just then, walking through the door to join them is none other than Derek Arden himself. But it's clear there's something about him that feels unhinged, and Derek begins to eat the flesh of the prefects. Now CL throws off his cover in order to fight the zombified Derek. And the prefects admit to CL that they were in fact the ones to kill Derek, and they hired the main doctor of the Phoenix organization, the same one from the HMS Campania, to resurrect Derek in order to cover up their crime. This entire time, the headmaster of the school was the Undertaker. Raise your hand if you were surprised. Anyone? No? Yeah, eh, that's what I thought. Turns out Derek was a really bad bully and was a lackey to Red House. Dang, he just can't get good lackeys, can he? Derek was stealing the work of other talented kids and passing it off as his own in order to look like a shining pupil, so I, I don't know, maybe I'm not too upset Derek is dead, but why not just report him? Because the vice headmaster was in on it, and in order to maintain the image of the school, Derek couldn't be touched. So they took matters into their own hands for the sake of tradition and upholding the values of the school, but also because Derek was a dick. The Undertaker continues to experiment with reanimating the dead largely because he is interested in the possibility of death not being the end. That maybe there could be something beyond death. And when Sebastian moves in to apprehend the Undertaker, they're interrupted by the Vice Headmaster, who turns out has been a corpse this entire time. As expected, the Undertaker gets away yet again. Ciel reports back to the Queen about how the Undertaker is reanimating the dead. And when Ciel leaves, she speaks to John, another person under her employ, and begins to toss around the idea that maybe having an undead army of her own would be really useful for the country. Not only was the public school arc a great, compelling mystery, but it was also a really good sports manga just thrown in there for random, and like, I didn't know anything about cricket. Now I understand, like, the fundamentals of how the game is played. But it also adds the new dynamic of the queen no longer quite being a good guy. We can't technically say she's a villain quite yet, but... She's slowly leaning toward the uncomfortable gray area in between. It leaves, a, 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 it asks a lot of questions, leaves a lot of questions for us to ask, and it creates so much depth for that character. This arc was expertly done. I am so excited to see how they adapt this in the anime. And I made sure that I cut out a lot of details just to make sure that if you want to read the manga, even after you watch the anime and watch this video, there's still, there's still a lot to discover when you watch the anime or read the manga. They go to the Somerset house in order to investigate the lockets they got from the Undertaker. 
turns out each one has a hair from someone who's deceased and a death date. After doing some research, they figure out that one of the lockets has the hair of Ciel's grandmother, Claudia Phantomhive. Now we move on to the next arc, the Emerald Witch arc, where there seems to be a number of deaths in Germany by people who enter a forest that has a witch and werewolves. The face of the cursed had their faces swollen, some live and some die of this affliction. They arrive to a village in the forest and are met with immediate hostility, but before things could get out of hand, they're greeted by Sieglind Sullivan, the liege of the forest, the lord of the village, a little girl carried by a big dude with cheekbone hair. Ten bucks says he's the werewolf. And my theory on cheekbone hair being the werewolf is thrown out the window when someone gets attacked by the werewolf. But this is the first time the werewolf has attacked their village, so who knows who what really happened. So she gives Sebastian and CL amulets that ward away the werewolf. It doesn't take them long to encounter the werewolf on their hunt, and immediately they're afflicted with sudden crying, bloody noses, and the strange skin rash. Now Sebastian needs to figure out a way to save Ciel. All you have to do is look at the wolfman and you're cursed. Thankfully, Sieglind is a witch that knows her way around to healing people up. And so Sebastian and Ciel take a bath in her massive cauldron filled with cleansing herbs. They manage to make it out of there, but when Ciel wakes up, he's lost his sight and is afflicted with severe fear and paranoia. So Sebastian pledges his allegiance to Sieglind and will be her butler until she can manage to save Ciel. Sebastian and Snake, all of CL staff are in Germany by the way, go downstairs into the cellar in order to do some snooping and discover a hidden staircase behind a secret door. Deep below, Sieglind uses her magic in order to try and quell the anger of the Wolfman, or Wolfmen. It seems both her and Cheekbone Hair know that they harbor the werewolves beneath their home. There's some strange plant that the queen asked to be retrieved from the forest with the werewolves. And now that she has it, she handwrites a letter specifically to Sieglind and has it hand delivered to Sebastian. Now pressed for time, Sebastian has no choice but to talk to CL directly and get him to snap out of it. And his plan is to eat CL's soul as he considers this him breaching his contract. He'll either eat his soul or snap him out of it. Finally being pushed to the edge, he remembers his revenge pact and is able to break free from the prison of his own mind. The addition of CL having to, you know, fight himself and overcome his fears doesn't really add much to his character. There is no character arc or big change of his character that of which has been accomplished. All we got is that he doubled down on his goal. Good job. I was expecting this to be a situation where we get to see how Sebastian deals with this mystery alone, but that isn't what happened. I don't really see how this improves the story or CL's character. But the shocking truth is that what the queen really wrote down is that she wants to have tea with Sieglind. Unbeknownst to everyone, Sieglind casts what she calls the ultimate spell to quell the anger. The spell apparently is the vile miasma that infects humans with the same madness Ciel had. The miasma is like oxygen to magical creatures, and the Emerald Witch is duty-bound to supply that miasma to them. Ciel and Sebastian steal Sieglind in the middle of the night, promising to show her the outside world, when in reality, they begin to show her the life she's always known is a lie. Her center for magic spells is actually a massive machine hiding a vaulted door leading to a high-tech control room. The amulets they give each villager is actually a tracker they use to maintain a vigilant eye on all of them and the miasma she's been duty-bound to produce has all been manufactured. This whole time, the wolfmen have only been villagers dressed in costumes, but the ultimate spell she created was real. She created the most powerful toxic gas ever known to man. This entire time, Sieglind has been lied to as part of a military operation to mass-produce Sulin, a potent gas, more powerful than mustard gas. CL gives her a choice. Now that she knows the truth about how awful adults can be, how awful people can be, will she continue to seek the outside world, or CL offers her solace in death. CL also tells her that if she made a poison, she, you know, might be able to make an antidote, and she likes, she's like, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's a good point. So, you know, we're good. And Sebastian burns all the research so they can't make more poison gas. One of the best parts is actually seeing Baldo fight cheekbone hair as they try to defend Sieglind from being captured. 
we get to see the, his military training go against other people with military training. The servants really don't get that much spotlight. This arc does a good job showcasing Finian the most, if I'm honest. I tend to forget the staff are a real band of badasses. Even the old man is insane. I wish they utilized the servants more because it makes for great, dynamic, and choreographed fight scenes. Now with the new increase in action in this manga, I can see now why they call it a shonen manga. I mentioned in my previous video that I believed Black Butler is has a larger female fan base. However, it's clear that as time goes by, they are clearly delving into the tropes and, you know, general expectations that we usually find in shonen manga. It's really funny because the mangaka literally states that the audience's opinion on the arcs swings back and forth. Every single arc, it's either the best or worst arc. And so it's like, you're kind of getting a little bit of everything. Black Butler's, you kind of get a little bit of everything you could possibly want. You just gotta like, oh, you don't like that arc? Don't worry, you're probably gonna like the next one. Some people hate action, some people love it, some people want the elegance and fanciness and tea parties and 11 Zs and really attractive butlers. It feels like Black Butler is a good blend of all these things. Cheekbone Hair planned on getting Sieglind back, but apparently everyone else was more than willing to kill her, so he said, uh, yeah, I'm not about that, I'm her butler, and when we thought he was a bad guy, he's more of just the on Sieglind's side. A good butler is a good butler. So they all managed to escape the secret government witch village. Finally, time for Sieglind to have that tea party with the queen, and Sieglind tells her how to make mustard gas, but she and CL exclude the creation of Suland gas, and even the even more powerful poisonous gas, and just, you know, pretend it doesn't exist. Apparently the Undertaker is somehow putting some sort of liquid inside CL while he sleeps, unbeknownst to either CL or Sebastian. Slowly we're seeing hints of the Undertaker having some sort of connection and obsession with the Phantom Hive family. I don't feel like the Emerald Witch story really contributed much to the overarching plot whatsoever. I can guess that maybe this only adds to the queen's power and she'll eventually show her hand sometime and will will it'll will be revealed that she's a villain that knows how to use inhumane methods of warfare. But if not, this arc was just fine. It felt it almost felt like the mangaka was adding uh, a, a historical arc just to like dump uh, all the all the knowledge of research that she's been gathering while writing this, which is a trap that happens to a lot of writers because you got to do a lot of research on certain things and you you learn so many cool so much cool stuff that you just want to share it with everyone and it can it can be hard to just like not like info dump a bunch of history stuff when you write when you write a story the most interesting takeaway from this entire plot is really that the undertaker has some sort of personal connection to CL and the phantom hives that of which CL is not even aware of next is the blue cult arc there's something strange happening at the music hall the queen said she sent people to investigate and they find nothing and they go back after after their investigation is over and somehow this is suspicious. Okay, um, not really ringing any alarms to be frank. No, the real shock is when Edward barges in and says that Lizzie ran away from home. Now we're talking. There's this diviner that Lizzie got her fortune read from and ever since she's been going back day after day to get her fortune read again and again. She's obsessed with the seer from the music hall. So they go to see Blavat and have Sebastian get his fortune read just to see what would happen. Without even missing a beat, he's like, <laughs> bro, I know you ain't human. All the sycophants of Blavat start demanding that Sebastian needs to get the heck out of their space. And he gives Ciel his fortune, telling him he's awesome and unique and protected by the Star of Sirius, and then gives him an amulet so that he can feel the protection of Sirius close to his heart. Everyone seems to be wearing those bracelets, and for some reason a street cat had one too, so Sebastian just steals it from the cat. Did you ever wonder what happened to the prefects from Weston College? Well, they got wrapped up in this divination star business and are now an idol group for the music hall. Everyone's gotta have hobbies, I suppose. I'd stand them. They bring CL to a special back room where 
untold fun is said to be had. And he sits in a chair, and there's a cool starry light show on the ceiling, and then he smells something and slowly drifts to sleep, and good golly gosh, there's a bunch of perfect looking corpses appearing here in there. How strange. After CL wakes up and gets out of there, Sebastian tells him to hold the front door. He smells blood. And on CL's arm is a needle mark where they no doubt injected him with something. Or even worse, they took his blood for unknown reasons. They get Nina, the, the stylist, that is also a character that has never been mentioned until now, the stylist that does costumes for the prefects to sneak them in so they can inspect the place. And oh yeah, I sort of forgot about Lizzie. She's here too. Inside, Sebastian finds the lab where they've been draining people of their blood, and he brings back Lizzie and some of the blood that's supposed to be for the Lords of the Stars. Apparently, they're literally giving this blood to avatars of the stars. Lizzie escapes because she's addicted to idol boy bands and mysticism, and so the only way to get them to leave is to make them want to leave the music hall. And Soma giving out food to children gives CL a great idea. They need to bring Lizzie to them. And the way to do it is by starting their own sexy idol boy band to rival the prefects. CL even starts his own music hall just to take away business from Blavat. This is the closest we're getting to fan service without deviating from the story. This is probably the best arc that's ever been written for Black Butler. As the music hall loses its audience, Blavat starts getting desperate for blood, and the plan was to have them drain so much blood from their members until they drew so much they died, and all Sebastian had to do was wait for them to bury the bodies and catch them in the act. Now they have evidence the deaths are from the music hall. Now that the story is out, the followers of Blavat are throwing away their bracelets and abandoning the music hall altogether. We haven't heard from Agni and Soma for some time. Turns out while Agni was cleaning out a fireplace, he finds a discarded picture of CL, and as he's collecting the pieces, he realizes something terrible. And just as he connects the dots that us, the audience, aren't aware of, someone enters the manor to assassinate Soma. Soma manages to push the gun away, but not without the bullet going through his palm. Agni works to defend Soma from the assailant, locking Soma into a closet so that he'd be safe. But Agni even with his incredible power, loses his life to the unknown assassin. They eventually find Agni still defending the door, no longer breathing, and carved on the wall is a cryptic message saying, who stole the candy from my tummy? Somehow, the assailant is CL, or a doppelganger of CL, still roaming around the manor. No joke, CL has a twin. We're literally doing the long lost twin brother trope. It, 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 it's, it's, it, it works though, don't worry, they've been setting this up. Just give me, just give me a second. All the mystery of who the imposter may be is gone, but j don't worry, we're, we get a payoff. Flashback! On their birthday, their manor was attacked. Almost everyone killed, and both CL and his brother, the person we thought was CL, were captured, as we know. The two of them were purchased by some rich man and then carried off to some strange club. This club, or cult, intended on summoning a devil, and these kids were intended to be offerings, but their souls needed to be quote unquote corrupted, and so they were. Um, bad stuff happened to them. You can fill in the blakes, it's very uncomfortable. This is where they were branded with this mark. It was by watching his older brother be killed on the altar, losing his faith in God, and spitting upon God's name. That was the ritual that allowed Sebastian to be summoned. To Sebastian, it was the younger brother that sacrificed the older brother, you know, sacrificing his own blood, that summoned him. The younger brother revered CL, the older brother, for all his accomplishments and his kind heart. And because CL was no longer alive, knowing that he was the lesser brother, he decided he needed to give CL back to the world by taking his older brother's place. Thus, he made a covenant with a devil he never intended to summon. This is where we see how clever the younger brother is. He could have wished for anything. That's what Sebastian told him. But the younger brother knew Sebastian was lying. There's no way the sacrifice could be reversed. Otherwise, how would the power of the demon even work? And because he knew Sebastian was lying, his first wish was that Sebastian could never lie to him, establishing that there was no way to bring back his brother, regardless of having the power of a demon. 
Then he had Sebastian burn the place to the ground after completing the other three wishes. So you might be wondering if the older brother, the true CL, truly was killed, and they established that not even with the powers of a devil could bring him back, how has he returned? Simply put, this was the goal of The Undertaker the entire time. As a Grim Reaper, The Undertaker rescued the older brother's body before it could be burned to the ground. Not only that, but he's also been lying to Elizabeth this whole time. The younger brother was never meant to marry Elizabeth. He's had to lie to everyone. Thus is why she never returned home. She learned the truth. And the entire reason Blavat was collecting blood was because he was helping The Undertaker to revive Ciel. The real Ciel. Blavat lies and says that it was actually the younger brother, Eyepatch CL, that was behind it all. They even planted evidence in order to frame him. And so, he was arrested for the murders of several innocents at, at the music hall, and for identity theft of the real CL Phantom Hive. Of course, the servants went out of their way to save him, but he's still a wanted man. Now, I hate to do this to you all, but given that Black Butler isn't actually finished, and even if I read all of the 33 volumes out of which has currently been released as of the recording of this video, and the story still isn't complete, I, I, regardless of whether I'm fully caught up or not, uh, it will be, I will be ending this video with the story unresolved. So I am ending the story, I'm ending this video right here at volume 28. The goal of this video was to hopefully get you guys to read the manga. I am a big, a big proponent of wanting people to read the manga more than watch the anime. The anime is a great way to get into manga, but like, I almost exclusively read manga now. Anime is boring now to me compared to manga. The story and the artwork just slowly gets better and better, as you can probably see while watching this video. It just gets better and better as time goes on. Yana Taboso's obsession with making the hottest butler that she can possibly make is slowly, we're getting closer and closer to it every single panel. I'd say that, I'd say that Black Butler is one of the safest and more interesting manga that you can read right now. I frankly need to applaud the work that's been put into Black Butler. It's, it's so much better than what I had expected it to be. And if you start it off and you're like, ah, oh, this is boring, you hopefully by watching this video, you know it gets really, really good. I hope all of you who have only ever watched the anime do yourselves a favor by reading the manga and do literally everyone else a favor by reading the manga. And I'm so glad the anime has decided to adhere to the, the, uh, the events in the manga because anything other than that is just wrong. I think it's really funny how we had like this whole period of time when animation studios would just veer off of the books and write their own stuff and everyone would hate it because it wasn't good. And then they learned their lesson and just said, okay, we'll wait for the books to release. And then over in like Hollywood video America land, we have Game of Thrones that repeated that exact same problem with like, and like there, like there wasn't a book to go on and they just started making stuff up and everyone hated it. History repeats itself. We learned this lesson a long time ago in the anime community. Tell me what you think of the Black Butler manga. Are you only now getting into the manga? Are you a long time reader? Tell me in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Stay beautiful and keep playing.